This is Digital Pathology Today. Now, here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. Our guest is Esther Abels, Chief Clinical Officer and Chief Regulatory Officer at Visiofarm, as well as the President-Elect for the Digital Pathology Association. Esther also leads the Regulatory and Standards Task Force of the DPA with a focus on FDA collaborations to drive regulatory and standard clarifications for interoperability and computational pathology in the field of digital pathology. We're going to be talking about standardization in digital pathology, not just the pre-analytic phase, such as staining and fixation, but also in the analytic component as well. What is the role of regulation? What are some misconceptions about regulation? And how can regulation actually help us to protect patients and provide better products and services? We're going to be talking about what's going on at the DPA, what the long-term mission is, what their vision of the future is for digital pathology, and of course, the upcoming meeting, Pathology Visions, October 17th through the 19th this month in Las Vegas. Esther Abels, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. And it's good to be here. And I really would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be present. We're very excited to talk to you. You are the Chief Clinical and Regulatory Officer at Visiofarm, as well as the President-Elect of the DPA. So first uh, focus a little bit on Visiofarm and then get into uh, some of the work you've been doing at the DPA and most importantly, the upcoming meeting uh, this week in Las Vegas. So first tell us a little bit about Visiofarm. Visiofarm has been around for quite a while now, I believe over over 20 years. Tell us a little bit about the focus of Visiofarm and what, what you're working on there. It's correct. We're having uh, our 20th anniversary. We have been in research for a long time, but also in, in diagnostics and clinic. So our focus and, and mission is really to support the digital transformation and also focus on enabling standardization in pathology. Because we know that there is a common identified problem and that there's a lot of variability between as well as within pathologists and labs. And that has been shown uh, by numerous publications. And we believe by offering AI-based image analysis that you can have a more reproducible, consistent way and also presenting precise results to scientists as well as pathologists. And then they can be reviewed and improve as such their, their data quality. We also focus on standardization and integration of workflows, which enable then the consistent output. And, and that's again, not only in research, but also in the daily routine in diagnostic and in clinic. The amount of digitization that differs a lot between all different countries. We're really big in uh, Scandinavia and Scandinavia is leading the fields uh, in, in Europe as well. And Visual Farm was part of a lot of these digital journeys in those hospitals. And with that, we gained a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of experience there. So we are working with tissue image for over 20 years right now. And uh, 10 of those have been working in the regulator, regulated diagnostic space in, in, in Europe. And now with our 20th anniversary, I just want to reiterate that we want to continue to drive this uh, in our anniversary years, of course, but also beyond big piece of what you're working on is standardization. And I think that can mean different things to different people. So what exactly do you mean by that? Because I think in digital pathology, we have issues about standardization, like, for example, being able to share file formats and getting all of our components working together and those kind of concerns. But then also, I think maybe what you were touching on is standardization in terms of the output in terms of what we actually would report as a diagnosis or if we're looking at features and things we're looking to quantify for clinical trials and so forth. So what, what, what exactly are we talking about with standardization? Correct. It's, it's mostly indeed because what you see happening in clinic, but also in research, it was previously, it was based of course on the analog interpretation that gives a lot of variability. So there we see that you really can improve. That's something to harmonize and to standardize the, really the outputs. So you make it more consistent, but also with integrating AI and machine learning in your current workflows. So that will then also enable consistent outputs. That's then not only clinic, but also in research. And that is highly needed in research because as we know, if you have like subjective outcomes, but also the way how you report outcomes or collect your data, if that's not consistent, the 
scientific background and the scientific material that you gather, the evidence that you're creating is of less added value. It's still of good added value, don't get me wrong, but it, it can be enhanced by contributing there and, and making it more harmonized and standardized. And then there's another thing that you can standardize, and maybe we can touch upon on that as well, but it's really about the quality, the stain quality. If you standardize that more, because there's a lot of issues with staining, if you can optimize the staining, then the pre-analytics part is that actually, then you can also provide better outcomes and also better outputs and more consistent outputs. The staining has been at the at the heart of what we do in pathology for the last hundred years or more, and I think it's only going to become more important as we move to a digital environment. So maybe tell us specifically what what are some of the projects and products that Visio Farm is working on? What do you offer in the marketplace? So in the research field, we are working on a wide variety of projects. There is a focus on multi and hyplex phenotyping, which is increasingly used in the still growing field of immuno-oncology. And the complex analysis of a high number of biomarkers, which is needed to fully understand the interactions of the immune system, for example, that cannot be done by the human eye alone anymore. So what we're doing there is we're um, looking into the deep learning based flexible phenotyping module and uh, provide these. So VisioFarm has um, some good modules there with multiplexing and hyperplexing. But we can also do that not only for immuno stains, but we can also do that for the classic bright fields and HNE and for all sorts of indications. And we have already a lot of apps available in our app center for customers. And then of course, in the research, they can also create their own apps specific to their own individual needs using the authoring tool. So that's really focused on research. Of course, the idea is that, that multiplexing that might eventually lead also more to clinic. So for the diagnostic market, that is focused now in, in Europe. Uh, but we can also expand there, of course. But for the diagnostic market in Europe, the projects that we have, um, CE, IVD apps, and they're based on AI, and, and they support the entire, the full breast cancer uh, biomarker panel. We have several publications out there that demonstrated the advantage of using image analysis uh, in the decision supports. And in a daily routine, how you can integrate in your existing lab is is very important to us so that's also why we partner with a lot of companies to allow that seamless workflow for the pathologist and the seamless integration into your own lab and we also understand that switching from analog to digital is, is really can be difficult can also be sometimes an obstacle to really start to go digital so what we offer as well is we offer advice on different steps and experience that we have from working with all these Scandinavian hospitals already. Lastly, focusing more on the projects, what I was mentioning with regards to uh, quality and, and, and especially stain quality. Studies have shown that quality and sufficiency of staining could have a significant impact on interpretive accuracy of the diagnostic tests, especially based on ISC, for example. And it has been reported that this could lead to false negatives or false positives in 30% of cases. So the human costs of inaccurate diagnostic interpretation can be high. And I'm not talking only about the cost, but really the human cost as well as financial cost. So that's something that we have to take into account. So what we do is we have AI and image analysis that can play an important role there that can be used for characterizing, quantifying, for example, the staining quality. And we can use the technology in decision support for organizations, for example, uh, proficiency testing and assisting in achieving both standardization as well as scalability and also later on ensuring that correct decisions are going to be made. We're at the forefront of developing and implementing those kind of quality tools. Incredibly important. And as you mentioned, there is a very high human cost. I mean, these are actual patients and patients' lives, and we're looking to provide the information so doctors and patients can make decisions regarding their care, which is incredibly important. As the chief regulatory officer, uh, how do you see your role there? You know, what is currently on your radar? And maybe tell us maybe some of the misconceptions that people have about regulation, particularly in this space. So let, let's first talk about the misconceptions. I believe that people believe that it's too strict. It costs a lot of money and slowing us down. 
don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing that it's not adding to lead time. Uh, regulations can add to lead time. They, they can add to the costs. But why I believe that these are misconceptions is because I believe we can use regulations and even are obliged to our patients to use regulations to help us to, one, improve, two, deliver quality and optimize patient care. Here are the reasons why I believe that. So let's start with improving. We have just been discussing that AI can help us to harmonize and standardize. Regulations can do that too. They help to harmonize, standardize, and develop general principles and understandings, like definitions, etc. So then two, regarding delivery quality, that's inherently related to, to number one, proving. I refer back to that documentary that I was watching. It's called Bleeding Edge. It's about development of medical devices and what harm they can cause to humankind, to patients. They trust our doctors and the healthcare and our systems that, and that they trusted what we provide to them. So they rely on us, that they rely on us to develop thoughtful and well-designed devices. And this documentary actually showed and validated why I'm here why we are doing this, why we want to improve daily, why we should be committed to bringing better products to the markets. It was validating that through thorough understanding of design control, one of the, the impacts or the, the requirements for regulations and especially then risk analysis is needed. If we do not implement this, our products can fail or can cause adverse effects to patients or users with disabilities or that as a consequence. So first of all, we need to understand what we do, why we do it, and for what cause. Then we understand that regulations do make sense. We should interpret them also, of course, with our common sense, and not only from the perspective, oh, I need to do this because I have to. No, think about your driving on a highway where warning signs are present uh, for a slippery road, for example, and you have to reduce speed. Most people think nowadays, oh, I will reduce speed, otherwise I get a penalty. But what we have to realize instead is that someone drove there before you and might have slipped and might have passed away. That is what that sign is telling us. And then the third one, optimize patient care, that's inherently connected to two and one, but also linking the regulations will help us to interpret the standard of care. What's already out there? How can we optimize and bring more and better products to patients? The regulations warrant us to monitor devices, that are on the market and that we can learn from those. Using the regulations help us to optimize performance, balance the benefit and the risk. And these three, re three reasons, uh, to improve, to deliver quality and optimize patient care, I believe that it's a misconception that regulations are too strict, too costly and slowing us down. We need to put it into perspective. We owe that to the patient. What we do, why we do it, and at what cost? And I think everyone would be in favor of optimizing patient care. And I've probably been guilty myself of thinking regulations were a nuisance, but I'm, I think I'm slowly coming around. I think it, in many ways it provides a structure and a framework that we can build upon, of course, not the least of which is to keep patients safe. And I know the uh, Digital Pathology Alliance has been doing a lot of great work in the area of regulations. We had um, one of the members on last season on this podcast and kind of what opened my eyes or was kind of a refreshing view was was the approach of how can we partner with regulators, work together to help develop the best tools possible that are ultimately going to, to benefit patients. So really not looking at it as a nuisance or a barrier. But specifically with digital pathology, it seems like two major regulatory barriers came down in the setting of the COVID-19 global health emergency. I guess A, the FDA regulations and we that's that's a topic of, unto itself FDA regulations in terms of clearances for slide scanners to be sold and marketed to pathologists and then B clear regulations which allow pathologists to sign out cases remotely so both regulations in both of those areas were eased how did you see the easing of those regulations changing practice in the past year was it a big deal? Did it make a difference? And if we got any gains from this, do you think we'll be able to hold on to them? With the DPA, we worked a lot on that as well. We indeed saw that the, the CLIA temporarily waived that you could not remote sign out, for example. The same thing was done by the FDA 
CAP guidelines were there and, and advising uh, to sell validate systems. What we've seen is that heterogeneous devices systems have been utilized during the pandemic and diverse cases have been reviewed, all kinds of cases, GI, placenta, whatever, and they were all done with varying QC processes in-house and validations uh, in-house and all showed actually that it can be done. So it enabled pathologists, of course, to perform the readings during the quarantine, but it was especially beneficial when, for example, there was only an expert institute for certain diseases and that you couldn't get access to. And we could show with remote access, you certainly have access to those experts and give optimized patients care. Second, in, in academic institutes where they're providing training programs, for example, they used also a lot of remote cases and review them together. So teaching residents or fellows. And of course, these are not unique in the US, but are already happening in multiple countries. I'm just talking about the, the community hospitals as well, which account for what is it about 40% of all pathologists in the US, I think they, they also share this experience in performing pathology using digital and remote setting. They gave them the flexibility to cooperate and communicate when they could not meet in person and tumor boards are meeting virtually using digital pathology. So it's, it's really allowing the pathologist to continue serving clinical colleagues and patients, not only during this challenging time, but I also believe beyond. And yeah, to, to come back to your question, like, could we able, would we be able to hold on to these beyond the pandemic? And I, I would say yes, definitely. But we have to take actions ourselves. So this is also a call to action to the community out there who's listening to this. There are great examples and experience out there. And as you mentioned earlier, um, I also would like to mention that we have to do it together. We have to join forces. So we have to collaborate also with FDA, but also with the CDC, with CMS, for example. But what we have to do is we have to look into what are those examples that we use during COVID pandemic and evaluate these, analyze these and share the learnings. That's not only sharing how great it is and how successful we can be, but also be open about the limitations. And only then we can learn and identify improvements and come up with ideas how to adapt. So we as a community have to put this into perspective so we can keep driving this forward. Yes, it, it, it can happen huh, beyond the pandemic. Will it happen tomorrow? Probably not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a journey we're on. We have to take it step by step. And sometimes we, we can accelerate, we have a breakthrough, but sometimes we just have to modify, take a step back and, and correct. So I think as long as we put it into the right perspective, we will get there. And I think that's where we need to let go of our competitive approach. A lot of people have this, it's, it's in our genes and that that's fine. But I often think about the saying, if you want to move fast, run alone. If you want to have success, do it together. So I think we have to step out of our cocoons, do it together and, and, and step up and take action. If you know, if you want to go far, <laughs> if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far to go together. I like that. I totally agree. I think it is up to us to do it the right way and to adopt these processes that fit our labs and validate them the right way. I think there was maybe a lot of fanfare around this, or maybe we were taken by surprise by the pandemic and really, for better or worse, pushed to do things a little faster than maybe we would have. But ultimately, I think it's incumbent upon us to validate these tools for use in our lab the right way. I think the FDA isn't giving us permission to incorporate a slide scanner. It's actually for the sales and marketing of the slide scanner, but we have to buy that slide scanner and validate it the right way. And similarly for you know CLIA and CMS, the requirement was needing a CLIA certificate in your home office or whatever remote location. And we would, we would get there eventually they just gave us a little bit of flexibility during this, this during this emergency period 
So speaking of the DPA, tell us a little bit about some of the work you're doing at the DPA. Yeah, personally, I'm leading the regulatory standards task force together with uh, Joachim Smit, and we accomplished a lot this year. I'm, I'm really proud of what we have done. We, for example, with the standards, we have had uh, several connectathons on new annotation standards at the European Society of Digital and Integrative Pathology. And now also we have one coming up at uh, Pathology Visions, so very excited. Um, we worked on, during the pandemic, to collect real-world data. So we have had some uh, interviews and some surveys that we send around. And we had meetings with the FDA, the CDC and the CMS to really discuss about this remote sign out, but also to talk about interoperability and how can you use different scanners with different image management systems, for example. And we will be writing a white paper about it to support the community as well as to present some results. There was in January, there was this uh, federal notice that came out by the Trump administration and they wanted to exempt 91 medical devices. These devices were temporarily waived from normal regulatory processes during the COVID-19 health emergency. And they wanted to make that permanent, but Biden issued a memo and that was then a regulatory freeze. What we did with the DPA, because we expected that would not happen, that the Biden administration would not allow to have all those 91 devices becoming exempt from 510k submissions. So we used this um, regulatory freeze, the 60 day comment period as an opportunity to further promote for interoperability and our ideas how to do this, how to get there, how to use the guidance and regulations for this and, and to allow for remote sign out. We more use it as a public event and opportunity. And we use that also again then to really strengthen our FDA DPA engagement. Uh, because during the pandemic, that was also extremely difficult. They put a hold on pre-submissions. And so with that, you usually gather information on what are the next steps for developing devices. And we were doing that with the DPA to identify the interoperability process, general principles for verifying and validating algorithms. So what we did is we turned it around. We had some uh, letters sent back and forth, and we're now having identified next steps that the FDA is willing to work with us on updating the technical performance assessment guideline for um, wholesale imaging devices. So we're really hoping that that could drive for the interoperability, as well as we're now working, we're invited to work with uh, the pathology uh, innovation collaborative community, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium and FDA's Digital Health Center of Excellence to discuss artificial intelligence in digital pathology. So I think that that's something that we have accomplished uh, last year and we can be extremely proud of. It sounds like it was kind of a great foot in the door uh, or maybe an unexpected opportunity perhaps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now correct me if I'm wrong. So the review of these medical devices that were where reg regulations were waived during the pandemic. And then, as you mentioned, it kind of got political and there was a hold put on. But the, the review of digital pathology devices looked very promising. I, I believe it involved the review of three years worth of data and looking for adverse events. And there were little, if any, adverse events. So I think, I think it looked pretty convincing that at the very least, these devices were safe. Is that accurate? That's indeed also how we reviewed it. But what we have to put in perspective as well is with regards to the little adverse events that, that have been published. I think they're just like a handful um, that's in the MOD database and that is voluntarily registration of adverse events. But nevertheless, we have not really heard about any adverse effects. Therefore, we really also noticed that together with the COVID had the pandemic where we mix and match different components of whole slide imaging devices, which are then the scanners and, and image management systems and all the publications that are out there to say, look, these are promising and we can go for interoperability. We can go for lower regulations, but that has not been accepted yet, but it's, it's good to indeed have that foot in the door to really work on that uh, technical performance assessment to update that one to see if we can put some different and other requirements in there to allow for interoperability and also to put 
the requirements in there and specifications for your products that people can use to really come up with the well-designed and controlled medical devices that we're bringing to the market. Yeah, interoperability is certainly a, a huge issue that we keep hearing about, uh, you know, that could impact uh, the future of digital pathology. And we're certainly among amidst uh, the a digital transformation. And I think a lot of practices out there are looking to go digital, a lot of uh, in a variety of settings, academic medical centers, large hospitals, smaller pathology groups. Uh, so really, what is the what is the vision that the leadership of the DPA has for the future of digital pathology? In short, it's really about that we believe also in collaborations. Collaborations with other societies is crucial. For example, we're now working also on reimbursement, market access, education, joint conferences, satellite conferences, learning from each other and supporting the community. So we're really engaging with those others, the other associations to identify, for example, the use cases for reimbursements, calculation models for return of investments, standardize usage and provide guidance guidance how to use it and, and coding of terminology, for example. And we all know that all of this is connected in this digital era. So we need to make sure that we are doing this together because going digital means there's so much going on. There's so many stakeholders involved, so so many parties involved also in digital pathology and that we cannot do it alone. So we can drive it and we can take initiatives, initiate, and that's what we will do within the DPA. So that's why we have the initiatives to really focus on education, focus on that reimbursement and the market access and return of investments to really drive the adoption so that this important asset can be brought to the market and that we can improve patient management. So that's what we are driving for, that we take these initiatives and then we work together and need to adopt where needed. We learn from each other and then we gather the information, also work together on how can we best implement, how can we optimize that, how can we improve it, how can we be successful. That's one of the things that we really with the Digital Pathology Association are focusing on. We can't do it alone, that's that's for sure. And you mentioned uh, return on investment, which was, I think, a key question to many people's mind or maybe if they're hesitant about even starting the journey of, of going digital. And the DPA published a white paper uh, in terms of making the business case for digital pathology in this past year. Uh, so maybe tell us uh, what were some of the key takeaways from this paper and do you think it, it maybe made things a little more clear in people's minds about what, you know, what, what the ROI is going to be? The paper was really contributing to indeed how, what are the economic implications of conversion from analog to digital? So one of the reasons that this conversion can take some time is because one is hesitant, right? And and what is then the real clinical use case to justify what is the direct financial impact in short-term costs, such as investment in equipment and personnel that can be rather expensive. And especially if you don't see the long-term effects. So we have to be able to balance these short-term investments, the financial investments, and measuring them against the long-term revenue potential, such as improved productivity and novel tests, improving patients' management, improving patient healthcare, so the downstream costs with regards to health economics and patient well-being. I think that's something that the paper gave a lot of insights there gave a lot of insights about the business and monetary considerations, how you can convert. And what I personally really appreciated when I looked, uh, when I reviewed this this paper is that there is a guidance on what are the considerations, for example, for the IT infrastructure. And we all know that that is a big challenge and a big hurdle and could cost also a lot of money and even or maybe especially in this digital area because you would say everybody's going digital with everything so why is this so difficult well we all know with pathology it's one of the last functions that goes digital uh, compared to radiology uh, etc they're they're already digital for a long time and with pathology you need storage you need hard drives databases integrations with with all the existing IT components think about cybersecurity think about LISs the packs 
reporting system, billing systems. Yeah, I can't think of so many. While you also want to optimize it for clinical use to provide a better diagnosis. So that's something that, that you're aiming for, uh, especially also now with remote use, right? Um, you have to think about how can you get secured firewalls, connections, bandwidth at the home office? What does that all contribute to you and to make a good diagnosis? That part is so important to understand. It should not be underestimated. Um, it also should not be underestimated, like how many, how much costs are involved for this. But we also should not overestimate it and see it as a burden and then refrain from implementing. So I think what this paper really gave me is that yes, it's a lot of work, but this paper gave a lot of tools how you can use this, how you can identify step by step, okay, how do I need to develop my business case and why you can go digital and maybe then you dare to say, yes, I step out of my comfort zone and take the step to go digital. The investment is worth it for the long-term revenue. It is a lot of work, but I think we're we're turning the corner. I think where we can really state state a business case and really show and really show that it is going to be worth it, where we can truly realize the promise of digital pathology. Now, the upcoming meeting for the DPA is October seventeenth through the nineteenth. Tell us about this year's meeting. What what excites you? What's going to happen this year? Yeah, we have a lot of great speakers, and I'm very excited with uh, with Bob McGonagall as keynote speaker. He is well known in our field, and he has so much experience and knowledge, um, which he's going to share from from the last two decades in in digital pathology. And what I really find interesting, he's always keen to share. He puts facts and observations into perspective. Uh, he plans some good questions and real good probing questions and uh, food for thoughts to, to drive this field. So I'm really excited about that. And when I looked into also the pre-conference workshops, they're very interesting. They're showing what's what's coming up, what's what's new in the field, what can we expect, what what is going to be out there for the coming years. So that's very exciting too to see to see what's happening and what's what's ahead of us. And then in the clinical track, um, what I noticed as well that there will be so much experience shared, and I am positive that there will be a lot of things about what you and I just discussed huh, with regards to the pandemic. Uh, how can we leverage that? How do we implement uh, things in in our environments? What have we learned? What were the challenges, and how can we overcome them? So there will be a lot of sharing and learning moments. I believe we can use that to our best advantage as not to reinvent the wheel again, as well as to the, the, uh, the, the pre-workshops. What I think with the education and research track is that we will get a lot of insights in, for example, how to use data lakes, how to use data, how can we scale it to further support the development in AI and machine learning. And then how you then implement this in your research to identify, for example, new opportunities, but also how can you optimize that and best uh, introduce it in your research to help improve patient care. So these are the ones that will definitely also be eye openers, some, some great initiatives that we will see and in a few years, maybe maybe even less than a few years, we can expect them uh, to, see, to, to see something of that in clinic. Yeah, some great, great initiatives indeed. So again, that's the DPA annual meeting, Path Visions, October 17th through 19th in Las Vegas. Uh, Esther Abels, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, before we wrap up, tell us, uh, where, do you see, where do you see the field headed in the next 10 years or so? What, what gets you excited? What really gets me excited always, and that's actually not only with digital pathology, but that's something that I just have. I have a background in biomedical health science, pharma, strategic product teams, proof of concept. Why I'm doing that, I'm here to contribute to making lives better. And that ranges from preventing diseases, that's extremely difficult, of course, to curing and managing diseases. So I'm committed to make digital pathology a success. And that's also why I joined, of course, the DPA and uh, together with uh, Dr. Gallus from the FDA and Dr. Leonard uh, from MGH co-founded, it's called now the Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community. 
and that's also why I'm very excited to be the president next year for the DPA, because I believe there are so many opportunities to have in uh, precision medicine. We can optimize a lot with what we already have, and we can, for example, start to identify more biomarkers better biomarkers, combined biomarkers. And that's that's what I see happening in the, in the coming years. We do not only use them, for example, to diagnose, but also more, they become more predictive and prognostic. Maybe also to use and monitor if treatments really work. Do they really can hit the targets? But do they also really hit, for example, if we're talking oncology, the tumor and how? So that's what I really am excited about. And that's what I see happening in this field for the next few years. Making people's lives better, a very lofty goal. Well, our guest has been Esther Abels from Visiofarm and president-elect of the Digital Pathology Association. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.